Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 260, I'm going to say 260. Hopefully it's 260. Hopefully I haven't got the numbers messed up. But if I have, please forgive me. I am your gracious host, Agostino Zinger. This is my podcast show. It's available on YouTube. It's available on your, all your podcast apps that you have. I talk about loads of po- topical stuff concerning stuff I've seen on the internet, stuff in culture. But mainly, mainly this is the streetwear podcast, the number one streetwear podcast in the world. Tune in for all your streetwear news, all your fashion-based news, all your stuff concerning stuff concerning the industry, um, stuff concerning product, releases, collaborations, whatever it may be. I am the number one place for you to get that news live and direct, uncut, raw, right? Right to the core. No, no corporate sponsorships, no big overlords over me telling me what to say and what I can't say. No product placements, even though I invite them quite clearly, right? No payola, even though I invite that quite clearly, right? None of that stuff. I'm clear and direct, honest to you, like a consumer, like as you are, right? You're you're a consumer, I'm a consumer. That's what I like to do. Let's have some fun, right? Let's have some fun. Hope you guys are well. Rested, hydrated, and all that stuff. Um, I'm feeling great. I've just done 50 sit-ups and 50, 50 push-ups. So I feel really sprightly and ready to go. I've got my nice bottle of water here in my uh, bottle that I got, like my little refillable Lucas Air bottle that I think I got this when I ran the Hackney Half Marathon maybe three years ago. It's probably not the best thing to be using now. You know, it's made out of some kind of plastic. I'm sure it probably has kind of passed its sell-by date. It tastes a bit funny once I put water in it anyway, but, you know, it is what it is. You just continue using the thing because you have no other, other thing to use. I should get one of those little metal flasks that people have now, those um hydro flasks and stuff. But as I mentioned in previous episodes, I have a real disdain with people who drink excessive amounts of water out of a hydro flask, especially the type of people that you meet at work. Um, they tend to always be, you know, the kind of people that don't really take priority. They don't see uh, working out as a priority. Let's just say that, right? So those type of people love to drink out of a hydro flask. Right? They kind of love to offset the fact that they've been eating, I don't know, bonbons and, you know, uh, chocolate, you know, biscuits and stuff with a bottle of water, which in my experience doesn't really work that well. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, um, that's what I'm doing right now. 50 sit-ups, 50 push-ups later on today. Or after work, actually, I'm going to go for a five-mile run. Haven't done one of those in ages. I'm probably going to do that three days in a row so I can get to my 15-mile um, uh, tar- mile a week target. And then, you know, just kind of make sure I lose all the pounds. The the dieting is going pretty well. The fasting is going nice. Oh, talk about fasting. I should got to start my fast now because I forgot to um, start it the other day. I'm going to do a really long one today, as you can tell. I just had breakfast. I'm just going to hold out until the next day. Um, yeah, so I'm feeling good, man. I'm feeling strong, feeling great ready to go hope you guys are well i've got loads of topics to run through of of the interwebs that i've kind of found over the week so let's just get right into it not waste any time and just yeah that's all you got to do in it just get right on in it right so topic number one this is something i found on a a podcast episode with uh donnell rawlings donnell rawlings was on uh the joe joey diaz podcast and again i think if you've watched if you've watched uh what have you watched what, what what have you may have watched if you've watched maybe a recent Joe Rogan, Donald Rollins has been on there twice in a row, I think. He was on he was on himself, by himself, sorry, and then he came on again with um Rizza from Wu Tang Clang. And if you're a fan of <laughs> the podcast, you'll know that it was a complete shit show with uh, Rizza because you know Donald Rollins kept interrupting every two seconds, which is annoying but really funny at the same time. So definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. But he had a really good appearance on Joey Diaz podcast and they were, you know, really good um I always find their conversations around comedy and around making it and around chasing your dreams really inspiring i think you can take that conversation um, and apply it to every area of your life whether it's you know your school whether it's at work whatever you're doing you can apply some of those life lessons to the stuff you're doing and i think the fact that they're all comedians there's an there's a kind of um intrinsic part of them where they kind of have to be honest you have to be brutally honest to be a good comedian i'd I'd assume you can't exactly because a lot of comedians say in it right you have to kind of find your let me put the camera a bit closer to me here a lot of comedians say you have to you 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 have to sort of find your voice when you're doing comedy right you have to find your voice you're not you don't know who you are first when you first start and part of the process of finding your voice is peeling back all the layers that you know have happened in your life every, every kind of experience you've kind of buried deep down because we've all have them we all have them right we have those brutally tough and 
really painful experience that we don't really want to relive that we kind of bury deep inside of us but if you're a really good comedian what you're going to do is that you have to kind of be open and really speak about it as open as you can so you can kind of get to the heart get to the funny bit of it which again is really difficult to do so i find comedians the best way the best um source of inspiration or motivation as opposed um in terms of how to keep my eye on the prize and how to keep steadfast in my in my journey and just to not kind of give up because they've gone through so many things that would in more in kind of the everyday sense of the word probably draw most people to kind of stop and just give up because you know especially the pursuit of comedy you know you're going up on the stage which is in, intrinsically something a lot of humans are really fearful of doing i think i remember reading somewhere that you know stand-up comedy or standing up on stage and speaking is the second most scary thing for most people in the world after maybe death right it's super scary because the the thought about it is i think someone like chris ryan said it from sex at the dawn that dude um who appears sometimes on joe rogan i think he mentioned something along the lines of um in the prehistoric times we had to basically humans our ancestors had to speak in public or in front of a crowd in order to kind of save our lives if we committed a crime or we went to, basically yeah, you, you you were sort of like your own lawyer in like, the public court of in the in the public court of opinion or yeah was that what, public court of opinion or opinion of public court wherever it is so that maybe is hardwired in us so the idea of standing up on stage is sort of like you're singing for your supper or you're singing for your life so that's why we're scared of it but nonetheless it's a very um scary pursuit you're constantly having to subject yourself to embarrassment to shame right to fumbling to failing again and again and again loads of comedians always say that you only get good after 10 years and then you get famous maybe after 20, right? Some of the famous comedians that we know of have only really got good after, you know, 20, 30 years in the business. So it's a really hard thing to kind of go through. Um, but that's where the honesty comes in. Anyway, going back to what Donald Rollins saying, because I'm rambling a bit here, but Donald Rollins came on the Joe Diaz podcast and he spoke really eloquently or made a really good point that sort of like I've been thinking about a bit here and I think I tweeted it somewhere here. Let me see if I can find it. Da, 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 da. He tweeted something that I kind of made a comment I thought was really cool. So this is a tweet that I thought was really interesting from Donald Rollins on the Joe Diaz podcast. I've got it up on my screen for my own Twitter profile. I know it's a bit narcissistic, but forgive me. Oh, don't forgive me. It's my own podcast. I can do what I want. So it says the following. Um, in this business, comedy, Donald Rollins quote on, on, Joe Diaz, on Joe Diaz podcast, sorry. In this business, comedy, you have to be willing to do what the next man won't do or hasn't thought about, or you'll end up just being some regular motherfucker. And again, it's it's advice that we're all for probably familiar with i don't think he's saying anything too that much different than what we've probably heard in all our years you know kind of going through life you know that for the most part if you want to make a if you want to stand out even in the job interviews right standing out in job interviews is probably uh one of the best lessons that you can learn in that regard especially when it comes to roles that are pretty easy to get or roles that a lot of people have the same skill and i think when it's the roles that are like at the higher echelon in terms of pay bracket they may they might call for a certain level of experience so it completely you know takes you out of the equation because you're just not old enough or it requires a certain level of expertise out of the equation as well because you haven't done you haven't been in enough jobs there's certain things that get you out of the out of the blue but most roles the stuff that i do marketing assistant community manager social media manager for the most part anyone can do that right there is no probably there is no probably differentiate there's probably not much different dif difference between somebody that's been three years in a job of being a marketing assistant and somebody that's been five years in a job being a marketing assistant so when you get to those kind of interviews you essentially have to compete with that person on the equal playing field but you're gonna have to make yourself stand out because the experience isn't enough because you both you both demonstrated three year and five year marketing assistant person you both demonstrated you can do the job you both know how to post on social. You both know how to make a content calendar. You both know how to write copy, write blogs, whatever, right? You have a good overview of the marketing landscape. You are great people. So you have to stand out in other ways. And that's where you kind of learn, like, you know, how to be charismatic, how to speak, how to carry yourself. Um, maybe you do some research on a company and you highlight some things that you've probably seen in areas of growth. Maybe you bring a presentation, you bring a slide, you bring a deck, whatever it may be. You have to do little things to kind of differentiate yourself so they can remember you when they are making their overall decisions because, you know, most of the interviews are done by a committee and stuff. So life is usually like that. But it can get difficult, right? It can get hard. It can get quite tiring. And I think even with me, with my whole DJing stuff that I've been doing, which is kind of the singular pursuit that I've been kind of exploring mostly as a hobby but you know if i if i have an option to take this 
to the moon and back, I'd be more than happy to. Um, same with the podcasting, right? If I have if I have a possibility to kind of cash out and make all my income solely through the podcast, I'd be happy to do that too. But I've realized too, like, you know, doing a podcast and uploading it numerous amounts of times in a week and, you know, maybe not getting the plays or listens that you probably want, you probably aim to get, can get quite disheartening, right? But then I think for me personally, I look at it, I look at most of these exercises as just uh, a necessary path, to, a re- necessary path as to where I want to get to. Like you have to go through this. I don't think anyone, unless you're a celebrity, and even if you're a celebrity, you know, I've heard, for instance, like um, the comedian Whitney Cummins has recently started a podcast and I heard her complaining just recently about her views, right? She was like, oh, I've only got 60,000 views or something. So I'm assuming if you're a Whitney Cummings and you're used to appearing on Joe Rogan's podcast and seeing your views climb up in the hundreds of thousands or the millions, to suddenly have your own platform and it be 60, it might as well be 16,000, it might as well be 10, it might as well be two plays. I get it. It's all kind of relative. But I think it's a necessary path. I don't think anyone starts, you know, I look back sometimes at those old Joe Rogan videos of him talking in a webcam with his friends on a set in his house. Those videos, even though he might have had, a, you know, he might have had some kind of notoriety coming into it, being on TV and stuff and being a UFC commentator, you still have to start from zero. There is no other way to kind of get to the top. You have to start from zero. So you just have to kind of grit your teeth and just go through it. It's just a necessary part of the, of the journey. And then I went back and looked at some of my DJ gigs that I played back in the day, right? And I look back at some of the history that I've done, some of the some of the things that I've played at, and just I was just like it kind of took me back again. I was like, bloody hell, man! I've gone through some absolute bull crap. So I think I'm close to approaching ten years DJing on my own, right? Solo kind of thing. Maybe I'd say consec like um, consistently the last five years, but overall I've been DJing for ten years. Um, and I looked at my stuff my listings on RA because I always try to put all my listings on there because I don't want to have a whole archive of all the places I played. Most of all my DJ gigs are listed. So if I go on my um, uh, my DJ profile on there, Handsome Black Man, I'll scroll down to events. Let me quickly put that there. Get this off. Let's take this away. It's just in the back here. Let's get this off as well. Oh. Let's go to events on here and let's go into two. So, so this is my profile, right? My DJ profile on RA just kind of made me think about the journey that you need to go on. So the header image is me playing at so special. No, it's me playing at the Alibi. Um, I think at their last event, their last their closing party for when you know, unfortunately, I'm about to close down. And Alibi kind of marked a seminal sem- seminal moment in my journey as a DJ. That's where I kind of established myself as a promoter co-founded this night called so special which was super popular which then sprung up to other events around town corner shop uh the nest blah blah blah. loads of places around dawson kind of had a good time there and then of course that kind of fell by the wayside due to you know just growing up and uh moving on the club moving on and one of the younger people probably didn't connect them as much and then just want to take a different direction me and a co-founder of so special kind of had a bit of a falling out so it just didn't work out in the way that i wanted to work out no problem but then it will come back full circle because I got to play the last set before it closed down. And, I, you know, I had a good one, played loads of disco, had a really good time. So you look at that and you're like, OK, cool, that's amazing. But then you scroll down to 2010 when I kind of first started. But it was, you know, a little bit before. I think it was in 2009, my actual official date, but I can't actually find that. And I got so special there. Right. But I scroll up to 2011. I think it's 2011. There's an there's an event here that I did. Right. It's got an epic story towards it. What can I find? 2014, 15. What is it? It's not that it was a weird event that i played right that was uh, absolutely horrendous i don't think i can find it right now kind of fresh not that one Ugh, i can't find it damn it i had it on here really anyway there was an event that i played anyway let's say around 2010 it wasn't then but it was another event that was probably one of the worst if not the worst um event that i've ever played in my life um it was in central london the, the promoter that helped that like, wind us to play. I'm not, I'm not sure how you got in contact with me. I think you found us maybe through Facebook or something. Um, emailed us, told us to come and DJ. We went to go play at some bougie um, kind of cocktail bar somewhere in Soho. One of those kind of basement bars full of like neon lights and glass and mirrors everywhere to make it look bigger. I know that kind of illusion, that kind of interior design illusion where they put mirrors everywhere to make it look more spacious, but it doesn't actually work. Full of loads of bottle girls. So immediately it wasn't our scene. And this, uh, you can imagine, right? If you think I'm a hipster now, 
I was I was I looked worse or I looked more corny back then, right? I was a proper fully fledged brick lane, buying my stuff from like Beyond Retro, Rocket, um, wearing those fucking plimsolls, vans with white socks, like just you know, I can like pretending I'd smoked cigarettes when I actually didn't, just fucking go right, not inhaling it at all. Just a disaster of a kid, right? But enjoying myself, having a good time. So imagine us kind of rocking up to a Soho bar and DJing there, right? So obviously we're playing, it's an early set you know no one's actually there by the time people come in they have their own friends playing the fucking highlight set so they basically get us to warm up and then essentially they don't pay us by the end of the night right and they do this thing that i never knew existed and i only found out and i only found that it was a common thing after the fact my co the co-founder dude that this special with kind of told me hey they're not going to come back right because i kept waiting around for them thinking they were going to come back to give us some money and they essentially stayed away for eight i don't know how they did it i don't know if it's a particular thing promoters do but they were around when we were playing they weren't even to go get paid we couldn't find them <laughs> And then um, when we tried to find them, every, every time we tried to find them, they would always be in a rush. Oh, hold on one sec, I've got to go do this. They were always running around. So they never stopped one minute to, for us to talk to them. But it wasn't like a, it was done in a very subtle way. You just couldn't get pinned them down to like say, hey, where's my fucking money? They always kept moving, right? They were like, like, they were like a fish in your hands, like a slippery eel. Just kept slipping out. Just when you think you got it in your hand, boom, it pops out. So that happened, and then we kept waiting around. And it didn't. It didn't happen. And by the end of it, we just and get frustrated. And I kind of go home in a strop, and we never got paid. Right? Called them at the end, emailed them, no reply, no money. So they, so they inevitably just finessed us out of the pee. Cool, that shit happens. But then I remember it was funny when I uh, realized I wasn't the only one because I remember watching an episode of Atlanta years ago, years much, you know, much, much uh, years after. And there's an episode in Atlanta where Charles Gambino's character. Is trying to get paid, he's trying to get his um, artist paid, and they're in a club. And the guy basically, and they do it perfectly like the promoter keeps, he's like, he always keeps what he always keeps like running away, like drifting away. There's like millions of people in between him. Every time the uh, Charles Gambino character says, Hey, where's the money? He's be like, One minute, one minute, I'll be with you one second, one second, and he just keeps slipping away, slipping away, disappearing into the crowds. And I think finally he does pin him down and he gives him, I think, half of the money or some of it. But then, you know, reading up on it a bit more, you realize that's a common thing that people go through. Even the most high caliber of artists go through that same sort of thing. Just for snaky um, promoters. Some of the some of the rationale behind it is that sometimes if a promoter puts on an event, let's say with Cardi B, and they don't get the um, they don't get the turnout they expected, but they paid Cardi B, a, you know, a gazillion pounds, whatever it may be, they probably feel a bit. They probably know that if they pay Cardi B this money, they'll be in the black. They won't make any P whatsoever. So they kind of refuse to pay in that regard because they didn't make the money back. But again, it's not Cardi B's fault. If you hired me for an event, you pay my fee. So I just remember just having that whole event playing in my head and thinking, wow, man, that was essentially, that was equivalent to what I'm going through now with my, with my podcast. It's just the early stages of it. You have to just do a lot of it, a lot of reps, a lot of reps. And then suddenly it will get to a point where I'm at a level where, you know, I'll be complaining about the next thing or whatever it may be. But it's just a process I have to go through. It's simple as that. And I think I wouldn't be DJing as often as I am now every month. You know, my next event is at the Heath Cotton Star, which is, I think, listed on here, isn't it, right? Heath Cotton Star on the 21st, I think, of December. So, yeah, I wouldn't be DJing every month that I am now. If I hadn't gone through that period of time, if I hadn't gone through those janky promoters, those horrible situations. And yeah, I guess it's just a message for anyone listening, you know, don't get, um, what you call it? Don't get beaten up by the process. The process is exactly what it is. It's an absolute process. It can take a lot out of you. It can really um, demotivate you, but it shouldn't. It should actually put a fire in your belly and it should actually make you know. And I, I think the more you struggle, the more you should be aware that this is exactly where you should be. Because it's very unlikely that you're in a position where you're like an overnight success and it goes from like zero to a hundred. It doesn't usually happen that way. It usually happens. You might get an overnight ex like exposure, overnight maybe look, maybe overnight cosign, but that doesn't mean you weren't doing your work like, you know, five, 10 years in the trenches beforehand. So you always have to be kind of quote unquote ready. And that's what I always wanted to be. That, that's kind of always been my dream. Like imagine if sometime, imagine if I have an occasion, imagine if I get to a point in my life where I suddenly get friendly with somebody from Printworks or, you know, somebody from X or Y becomes my friend or something happens, right? No, no, they stumble on the video and they're like, oh shit, this guy's cool. Let me book him to play a warm-up set. I just want to be ready. I don't, I don't want to talk a big game and act like I want to be on that platform. And then when I get like a lucky shot, oh, someone's sick, someone's flight got canceled. I then I'm not, I'm not prepared to like play. I have to be prepared at all occasions to show up, show out and show exactly why I belong on that platform. Or why, I, why I belong exactly on that stage that everyone else is playing. And I think that's what applies to everyone as well. So 
um, don't get disheartened. This is the process. It is what it is. You have to kind of go through it. And hopefully over time, um, you'll get to a place where, you know, you're in the position that you want to be. But again, the process is the process. Anyway, let's move on quickly. Oh, gosh. Again, my nose is so... Hay fever is a lot. Hopefully that mic didn't pick it up. It's not the best mic in the world, so hopefully it didn't pick up all the snot cascading out of my nostrils. Oh, Jesus. It doesn't end. I think mostly because I put loads of sarancha and stuff on my food. Then I drink copious amounts of water that obviously helps with the mucus, but it's not the best thing when you're, you know, trying to make a podcast. But hey, you know, maybe too much information. Is it too much? We don't know. Anyways, move on. <laughs> Let's move on before I make everyone vomit in their mouths while they're listening to this. So, number one, talk about... Oh, Jesus. So, T.I. appeared on Red Table Talk, right? Um, I'm sure you are all aware of Tia's comments regarding his daughter. He went to protect the sanctity of his daughter's virginity uh, by what he what he kind of joked about on the podcast was that no, I think yeah, Tia appeared on the podcast. I think it was of a athlete's wife or something. I don't know which one it was, but eventually the podcast never actually came out, did it? I think they drew to all the backlash. The women of that uh, you know that actually were running the podcast decided against kind of releasing it because that's you know it's a good thing. Those podcasts will last forever, and that girl can get bullied forever. So essentially, Tia goes to the podcast. He says, I think they have a conversation about how he parents a teenager. I think something along the lines of that, and somehow. Within our conversation, T.I. divulges the fact that he jokingly or not jokingly makes ensures that his daughter's hymen's intact because he doesn't want her to be defiled by these, you know, young boys running around. Obviously, it's a crazy comment to make. Obviously, something people wouldn't, you know, your average day father out there wouldn't say. It might be a fear you have internally, but you wouldn't go out there commentating on your wife's on your sorry, on your daughter's, you know, private parts or in any way, shape or form. You won't be talking about her having intercourse with strangers, let alone people in your family, which would be weird anyway. So it's a strange situation. But I guess in some respects, you can understand it with the caveat that he's a famous person, right? He has a famous person. He's kind of transitioning into this uh, cultural critic of sorts. He's not making music as frequently as he did before, even though his last album was really, really good. I really enjoyed his last album. Super stellar work. Very mature southern rap. I really recommend you check it out. But you can tell he's transitioning away from that and pivoting into being a cultural commentator. And I think with his age and given the fact that musically he probably isn't as hot as he once was, and maybe most of his notoriety coming now, maybe mostly down the final of what he says on stage and also the stuff he does with his family in the TI and the Family document um, reality TV show they have, you can be forgiven to. You could forgive him a little bit for kind of being a little bit um uh, for being bitten by the outrage bug, right? He's probably so desperate to get some attention on his podcast, to get some level of notoriety. Because, you know, if you're TI and you're the quote unquote king of the South and you're not getting the listens or plays that you want, maybe subconsciously it will play some it will play a part in the things that you say. You might be a little bit more reckless in the things that you do put out there because you know inevitably you can steer people back to your podcast or back to your social activism work, whatever it may be. So maybe that's part of the reason that it played into. But still, it was very uncomfortable to listen to. And I think, you know, the internet, you know, um, in a really mature way, I think, kind of called him out on it. I don't think he got ousted too badly. I don't think people were saying that, you know, he was a creep or anything. They just assumed that, you know, He's a father, a young. He's a you know. He's a father of a of a of an attractive quote unquote young girl, um, in the industry now or on the scene now, and he's probably just worried, right? Because he knows how he was when he he was with girls at that age, and he knows you know, essentially it's quite scary to have a girl that looks like that, a daughter that looks like that out in the world, as a young father who's also a bit of a womanizer back in the day. So you can kind of forgive it in some respects, but you know, for the most part, people kind of chastise him. And then in a in a really strange um, turn of events, he decided to go on Red Table Talk and kind of say his piece. The one thing I do rate about T.I. in this whole episode is that he didn't double down on it straight after because I think that's usually a thing that people do. People are usually, is it loud and wrong, right? When they kind of like say something stupid, they get called out by, by the internet and then they sort of essentially dig in deeper and dig more of a hole and not try and apologize and essentially say, you know, I said what I said, now what kind of thing. And T.I. didn't do that. I guess because he was probably roundly chastised and pretty sure women in his own family were probably calling him out. So there was no need to really go out and defend yourself because you knew what you said. You had to kind of maybe explain where that kind of conversation came from or it kind of came to head. So he decided to go to the Red Table Talk, which has now been, 
build, I think, um, uh, obviously from uh, Jada Pinkett Smith's platform, which is, I think, a really good platform to have that conversation because you usually get the three generations of uh, women. You know, you get uh, Willow, you get Jada, and you get her, her mum. So you get perspective from three different women in three different stages of their life. And this occasion, Willow wasn't there, which was, you know, a bit disappointing. I feel I would have liked to have heard her perspective in terms of how it must feel for a, a young girl growing up in quote unquote Hollywood or California, having your father be so, you know, out front and outright about his kind of how he feels about the way you kind of conduct yourself out there in the streets. I don't know how to say it in the right way, but I would like to hear what she had to say about it. Like, you know, if there's been some kind of conversation between her, Willow Smith and Will Smith, if there's something there. Just her kind of learning from it. Because what we did see, I think, from the backlash of it was that the daughter did go around and start liking comments that people were kind of putting up on Twitter about, you know, T.I. being a bit of a creep and it being super weird that he'd go out into gynecologists and, you know, ask about um, his daughter's hymen, which he obviously ne never to be disagrees with. But I think that whole hymen thing was weird because I think at the time, the daughter didn't know it was a bad thing. I don't think she... Has, she probably thought it was annoying, but she didn't see probably the level of... um. um <sighs> I don't know, she probably didn't see the level of intrusion that other people did see. And it's, it's a common thing that you get when you grow up in a religious household. Until you go, I remember even with the stuff that I used to go through at home, you don't necessarily know what you're going through at home is weird until you go to your friend's house or you speak to your friends about it, like getting beaten or some shit, right? With, especially with instruments. Sometimes you talk to your white friends, you're playing football with, and they're looking at you like, bloody hell, man, that's child abuse, right? And then you and your black friends are busting up laughing about the fact that you all got beaten with a stick, with a bat, all these nut nutty things. And then the same sort of thing happens when you have friends that are not religious and they find out that you go to church five days a week, six days a week, sometimes twice a day. Like, what? Do you know what I mean? They just can't get their, their heads wrapped around it, right? No man could never force them to do anything. So sometimes it's probably the worst thing if you're a kid or if you're a parent in that respect and you put your kid in like a public school, quote unquote, with other people who don't necessarily share your same sort of um, family values. It can completely get rid of or erode all the work that you've kind of been steadily doing with over the years in a matter of seconds. And this Red Table Talk is another illustration of it. But this one point really kind of stood out to me, this quote, a little clip I'm going to play of the Red Table Talk, it really kind of made me think, I don't know, is T.I. really... Like, is he just projecting? And I think I'm going to play the clip and you'll kind of hear what I mean, right? So this is the, from the Red Table Talk. Like, get up on the screen. I kind of get the feeling that he's probably just projecting as opposed to actually looking out for his daughter. So let me see if I can get the point right here. Which, you know, unfair to say maybe because we don't know what he's doing behind closed doors. But I will just judge from a from a, from a far that he's projecting as more so than protecting his actual daughter. So here's a T.I. or tip, as I Let's know get him. it here. Made some highly controversial... Mm -hmm. because... A father Let's like go. myself who mm -hmm. wants to be as involved and as attentive as possible, we could draw the conclusion of we just donate sperm and come pay for things and we don't really have no say-so in how things no, are handled. No, th that's not true. I, I right. don't think that's... Uh, again, see, he's just... I I kind of... Again, you got to defend yourself if you're T.I. I think he's kind of prided himself on being this really intelligent, philosophic, philosoph philosoph philosophical southern dude, right? does more than hip-hop don't underestimate me i'm smarter than you think but you can't defend yourself this way you can't just say like oh forgive me for Kate giving a crap about my daughter again it's just projection like he was obviously a bit of a womanizer back in the day he obviously put up some numbers he obviously was a favorite of the ladies back in the day and you know he he enjoyed himself he did what you have to do when you're a young guy coming up in hip-hop making millions and millions of dollars whatever no one's judging that but i think he's projecting that idea of how he was a bit of a scumbag with girls onto these other dudes who she might end up not hooking up with anyway just because you know she's a good girl or maybe because she's just not at that stage in her life now and you don't know she might end up crossing paths with a guy that's really nice you know that really likes to, wants to take care of her and you're again you're denying her that experience i think in general anyway especially with, I, I remember growing up in a religious household what happens with this kind of control this rule your parents it's less so as if it's it's, it's less about you wanting to do the thing that they want you not to do and it's more so about them just not allowing you to just have an experience. I'm pretty sure a lot of the guys and girls who grew up in religious households or grew up in houses where you didn't, weren't allowed out, you probably didn't want to go out as much as you made it assumed. You probably argued about it, right? You had fits, you stomped around your room, you threw stuff, you swore at your parents, you had fights and stuff. You probably didn't want to go out that much. But it's just the idea that someone could tell you you can't go out at all that was annoying. Like, I just want to go out by myself. I, I, I want to decide if I want to go out or don't want to go out. But you don't just decide for me that I just don't want to go out. That's insane. But inevitably what ends up happening, the more you do that, 
you just drive a person to like not ever listening to you and just completely doing the opposite just to kind of wind you up and i know i did when my parents used to stop me going out i would just stay outside for ages i would never i wouldn't come back until like four o'clock or six o'clock in the morning which means you know if i'm staying out that late that means i'm going up to all sorts of nonsense but i'm only doing that because i don't want to go back home because i don't want to face my parents and also i just want to what piss them off like i know that every hour that i'm staying outside is boiling their piss it's driving them crazy. And I'm hoping that over time, that's going to inevitably lead them to a point where they just let go of me completely, which end up happening, you know? They end up just letting go and be like, you know what, we've had enough, do what you want to do. Which you kind of think you've won really, but you haven't because, you know, in that process of time, if you're a girl, you might have ended up getting pregnant. If you're a boy, you might have ended up, you know, developing an alcohol or a drug problem. No one really wins that situation. Your parents end up, you know, essentially ruining your relationship with your children and the children end up, essentially destroying their own lives before it's even started. It's just a horrible situation for everyone involved. That's the case at all. And I don't think anybody has a problem with you being involved in that. I think it was more like, that's so, so very personal. I don't think anybody has a problem with you protecting. That's it. And he's still smiling, but he doesn't get it. Like, that's the whole problem. No one cares if you're involved. I think, you know, there was that famous video of that dad. Um, do you remember that, see that video that went viral a couple of weeks ago? of this guy going to pick up a, his girlfriend for, a, for the first couple of dates, I think, whatever it may be. And uh, the dad wasn't at home, but he's got a camera in front of his door and he's talking to the kid through the camera and the microphone. He's basically saying, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? And just giving them, you know, the dad grilling. And at the end, he's essentially like, make sure you look after my daughter because if you don't, I know where you live. That sort of thing. And it was quite funny. It was a bit humorous. You know, there was some, real, some realness to it. But I think every dad is going to do that with their daughter, right? That's your little princess, right? That's cool. I think every guy that would approach a door would also understand you know the fact that you'd step to them that hard but this level of control without there even being a threat or an inkling that your daughter is actually interested in anyone i think it'd be a different story if like his daughter came to him and said hey dad i'm ready to get married i'm ready to have a, a kid and stuff maybe this whole freak out would make more sense but it doesn't seem as if he this has been this is in reaction to her daughter kind of going out and sleeping around this is a reaction to just her growing up and becoming a woman, a young woman. It's like, if this is how you're acting now, imagine when people are actually getting interested in your daughter. I don't know. You know, let's just like, and I don't know if, if there's one thing you can't tell girls about, especially young girls is if, I've watched enough movies to know that, you know, you can't, and I'm sure some of the stories are a bit overblown, but if there's one thing that girls will not stand, especially what young girls is being told who and who they can and cannot hook up with. They just won't stand for it. So T.I. is playing a very, very dangerous game here your daughter no nope. that's not the issue it's the hymen the thing it's the hymen part of you <laughs> and having been a young girl myself mm -hmm. horrible, having yeah. raised several young women and realizing that a woman's journey in regards to her sexuality has to be guided mm -hmm. right mostly i think by mothers that's right. just me personally mm -hmm. okay. agree. but agree. Mother, look, he's, he's not, he, he's not, he, he's, he's not, he doesn't agree with it. Guided by mothers, he thinks, nope, guided by fathers. Imagine having a conversation with, like, I don't, is there, are there any girls out there that speak to their dad openly about relationships and stuff? Maybe if you're single, if you, if you, if you just got a single parent household, that makes more sense. But are there many girls out there that do that? Are there even many females who have loads of guy friends who talk to their guy friends about sex? <sighs> Understanding what that journey is mm -hmm. takes her daughter's hand and walks her through. Okay. Right? That's how I work that out with Will. There's just certain things about raising a man right. that I can't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would tell him. He doesn't believe it. I'm, I like Tia. He just doesn't buy it. He doesn't buy it. He doesn't buy it at all. Look at his face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's certain sensitivities. Okay. That you just don't understand. That you might not understand and have just this because of your relationship in the world I is different that. than a woman's relationship. I right? respect that completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I knew mm. when you talked about it, because I live with a man that loves his daughter. Right. You know, in the conversations I've had to have with him in regards to what is protecting her, mm -hmm. what is educating her, what is actually allowing her to self-actualize as her own individual self versus control. Sure. Right? So when I heard what happened, I said, I know what he's trying to say. Right. Yeah. He's like, I'm present. I'm present in a way that anything that she needs, That's right. any kind of trouble I feel like she might be in, I'm right here. Yeah, exactly. I got her. I got yeah. her. Right. I totally understood that. 
but <laughs> at the same time, especially when we're dealing with these kind of sensitive issues, knowing the extent of that protection. Exactly. The idea that people thought you were trying to control your this daughter's is the bit that got me. virginity yeah, it versus... Is. Look at it. Look at his answer. That's very different. I it have is. a question. Okay, yeah. ask it. Okay, first of all, the word control is very... But you know that's what it sounds like. I know, him. but in order to guide or direct, you must have a certain level of control of anything. Okay, so... Nah, see, I, lo I, I love the... I love, I love Jada Smith's mum face. That isn't true at all, and that is essentially the issue I have with the entire interview. And that kind of encapsulates how it must... How it feels growing up in a religious household, growing up in a very conservative household, growing up in a very African household which I had to go through. Again, I don't blame my parents. I just think it must be so difficult growing up one way in Africa and coming to a country like Europe or coming to a, you know, a continent like Europe or coming specifically to a place like London and having your kids here and having them running around, frolicking, you know, doing the things that you could never imagine doing when you were a kid and just having, you know, having these freedoms and these tools to your disposable, dis disposal as a kid that they would never imagine they could have. And sometimes, sometimes it can be really frustrating when your kids don't, you know, take advantage of it. I remember my dad always saying that all the time. You've got, you know, it's a land. This is the land of milk and honey, and you're not taking advantage of it. You know, the streets are paved with gold. Like for my dad, like he essentially thought or assumed we were being lazy by being. We were basically what doing enough with our lives, right? That the streets, you know, there was like money lit around the streets that we weren't kind of picking up. Which he probably has some point to, but you know, it's not that big. It's not really the the whole crux of it. So anytime he saw us playing the computer game or, you know, watching mindless amounts of TV, he'd just be like, it'd make him furious because he'd be like, you know, the stuff I would be doing if I was your age, right? That's what he's probably picturing himself, like, with the drive that I have, da, 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 da. But obviously, we're not coming from the place that he's coming from. We haven't seen the darkness that he's seen. We haven't seen the level of the po poverty, of depravity, or we haven't gone from, you know, I've, we've got, I've got some family members who are incredibly rich, right, prior to the Civil War and in, in Angola when it broke out. And as soon as the Civil War happened, bang, they lost loads of money. So I understand that kind of drive and also understand how they can be a bit of a disconnect with your children but i also think that there's this idea that somehow controlling your kids is the way to then grow up and to be like um you know um uh, valuable members of society and i just i don't think in this society you can do that i think it's, it works in a society where everyone else is doing it i think the moment that's what i'm saying the, what happens the issue that those kind of parents have is that the moment your kid leaves your household all bets are off they only have to see things. If they don't even need to talk to anybody, just seeing things alone is going to make your kid rebel or act out against your wishes. Simple as that. I don't need to speak to anyone. The moment I go to a primary school and I've noticed that some kid next to me has a sandwich with cheese and mayo in it, I'm going to go back and try and make my one. Even if my mum says, no, you shouldn't be eating that because it's going to make you fat, I'll just do that. The moment I see a kid staying out a bit late playing in the park, I'm going to want to play out late in the park. Just tiny things are going to trigger and are going to kind of essentially keep keep the kid like banging against that door control that you're kind of laying down it's always going to happen and also i think guiding and control are two different things you can't control to guide that isn't con guiding that is essentially control and i think with young people especially young girls i've dealt with enough of them in my life um especially the more um uh, you know sexually active ones especially when i was younger especially going to uh quote unquote um not quote unquote but like a catholic sixth form and dealing with some girls that were from the Catholic schools. Those girls were inevitably, I think most boys will attest to it, that most of those girls were maybe the most um, sexually active girls you'd ever crush past with, ever. And most of it had to do with issues that they were going through at home. And there's even some boys out there who specifically go after girls who have issues at home like that. Parental strife, you know, maybe parents are getting divorced, maybe you have the girl has beef with her mom or her dad. Girls, girls would specifically sometimes scoop in and kind of slide in and kind of comfort those girls because they knew they would just completely act out just to just to kind of you know subconsciously piss off their parents. So what Ti is doing, if he, wow, he's not realizing it, even though he's trying to go out and control his daughter, he's inevitably leading her down this path, which obviously you don't wish on anyone. Touch wood. He's leading down her. He's leading her down a path where she's just going to act out sexually just so she can reclaim her own sexual identity as kind of willow smith is kind of um so as jada's pinky smith is kind of expounding upon she end up doing that which is something that you don't want of course right and i just don't know why he can't see that that's the thing that's a bit worrying to me like you are the more you're trying to control her the more you're going to be unable to control her and then when she suddenly starts acting out it's all going to make sense like sadly and again i don't have any super i don't have any I have a lot of sympathy for the guy because I think it must be really difficult to raise a daughter 
of that age in Hollywood at this present time. I'm pretty sure it is. It probably is not the easiest thing in the world, but I just would wish that some of these celebrity people would kind of keep their opinions to themselves when it comes to their family. I think looking at what Joe Rogan does and how he does, doesn't mention ever his wife and kids on the podcast and stuff, I think it's because you would never to be getting to a position like this. You would never to begin to a position where you are, you know, spilling family secrets, you know, saying things in public that don't necessarily go down well with your other family members. And I think even a really obscure example, but I think this is inevitably what led to the whole um, Burt Kreischer and uh, Ari Shafir fallout when Ari Shafir has supposedly, or did actually allegedly, or he actually did not allegedly, when he um, spiked Burt Kreischer's drink. That whole thing happened. And then now I think Burt Kreischer, these two comedians, Ari Shafir and Burt Kreischer, they had a, a big it's all like falling out during the end of sober October because uh, Irish Shafir went on Burt Crash's podcast. They were having a good time. And then Irish Shafir sort of spiked Burt Crash's drink with a bit of MDMA, right? To make him a bit loose and to get him to enjoy himself. Not knowing that the, that comedian he spiked to drink of was having um, um, heart medication. They were going to have a family dinner later on. They were just, you know, they're living their life. Imagine spiking someone's drink, your friend who kind of has kids and a family in the next room. It just isn't something that you do, in it? So they have a big falling out. The wife inevitably says, hey, that comedian can't come out to the house anymore. I don't want to see him. I don't want to talk to him. You know, he's excommunicated. But if I look back on it, the reason why that happened was because Burt Kreischer's comedy is essentially, it's obviously quite self-deprecating as most comedians are, but he inserts a lot of his family into it, right? His comedy specials, I think, famously told, telling stories about one of his daughters being incredibly dumb or, you know, in his eyes, incredibly stupid. And he consistently kind of brings up his family i think so so much so that one of his specials is called secret time right because he inevitably does this thing where he tells people secrets that the whole crowd hey this is a secret don't tell anyone you know it's quite funny in itself so i think that looseness of being so upfront and putting your kids on social it kind of allows comedians to kind of intrinsically or subconsciously think that you know all bets are off i can talk about your wife your kids and it doesn't matter because you're putting them on social so i wish says said something i think maybe a few years ago where I think one of his daughters was kind of having issues with her teeth and he made some comment about her teeth being fucked up. And, you know, imagine the girl was like, I don't know, 13 years old or something and he laid into her like a comedian would. And imagine getting ripped to pieces by an adult comedian that happens to be your dad's friend and you're, 13 year, and you're a 13-year-old girl going through whatever you're going through when you're growing up through puberty and stuff. And that kind of built a bit of friction. But that's where it kind of started from. That kind of oversharing from his dad in Burt Crashers since started this whole cascade of you know, of events that inevitably led to, you know, Irish Fear spiking his drinking MDMA. So I just think sometimes you have to be conscious the fact that you're the famous one. T.I. and Tiny, they're the famous ones. Their kids are not right now. And if they do decide to be famous, fair enough, but you have to be conscious about how much of their information you put out there, which is why I've always been quite slightly uncomfortable with the whole Kanye and Kim, you know, parading their kids everywhere because, you know, maybe they don't want their pictures around when they're that age, right? You might want a bit of privacy and stuff, which is what I think... Um, Angela Jolie has done with their kids that they've adopted and Brad Pitt, right? They essentially have kind of kept them out of the limelight. So if you do decide to go into the limelight yourself, cool, no problem. But we're going to try. It's, it's probably going to be really, it's, it's really going it's to be really hard because no matter what private school you go to, if you're Brad Pitt's and Angela Jolie's kids, you're still going to be the most famous kids there. But we're going to try and give you the most normal childhood that you can get. And then if you decide to come into the business, no problem. But this idea that you're going to go out on the podcast and, you know, talk about your your daughter's sexual reproduction sex sex, uh, reproductive organs is just yeah it's a mad one man it's a mad one but yeah big up ti for actually going on red table talking talking about it um i watched the whole thing it was the same it was a bit of this much of what i've kind of spoken about there um i get the feeling that he was sorry that he embarrassed his daughter but not sorry that he's kind of you know this controlling invasive father i think he's going to continue doing that that's just the way he parents it is what it is I think we can take a lesson from it as we want and we sort of just move on in it. Probably other things to concentrate in the world than have some guy parents his daughter, but you know, just sad to see in general. But what can you do? Let's move on. Uh Papa John's uh founder is having a bit of a funny time on the interwebs. Hello. Um, so Papa John Schnatter, guys, he's just not let's having let's it. Let's put it up, 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 pause it. Pause it, pause it, pause it, pause it. Pause it. Come on, there we go. YouTube is taking so long. So I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of the meme going around the Papa John founder. Um, I think the big, why this is the big deal, I think because uh, prior to Papa John's, prior to all this debacle that's happened since the Papa John founder got asset from his company, 
Papa Jones was like one of the official partners of the NFL. He had really good relationships with the you know organ uh, franchise owners and stuff. And the NFL essentially looking from the outside in is kind of like the United States royal family. Like once you're an owner of a team, you'd never let it go. It's like it's a basically a dynasty that gets passed down to your kids. Uh, the kids, the kids get involved somewhere or the other. Um, they're front and center at all the games. It's a real big thing, right? Because obviously American football is, you know, the biggest sport in the US for the most part. So Papa Jones being associated with um, NFL was a big deal for him, right? Smoozing and, you know, being pally pally with all the founders and sorry, all the owners of teams sitting up in a press box. It's just a big, it's a big thing, big part of his identity. So the fact that he got ousted from his company due to an issue, I think, concerning HR. I think there was an issue about somebody using the N-word in some sort of meeting. And he essentially did what that Netflix guy did where they were having a uh, some sort of HR or, you know, staff meeting. And he essentially read out a transcript of what was said. And he said the word that was on the paper. Instead of saying N-word, he said the actual word. Um, <laughs> obviously, someone in the, in the someone, one, one of the staff members snitched, reported him. And because it's a publicly listed traded, public, because it's a publicly listed traded company, even though he owned majority shares, he still somehow was outside of his own company, which is quite messed up if you think about it, right? Regardless of what you think about him saying the word, the fact that you own a company and it's named after you and it's got your face on the box, you can still get ousted out of the company, even though you own a majority stock, is wild, 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 wild. And I think since then, they've kind of enlisted Shaq as the brand ambassador or maybe he owns part of it. Um, and it's just a constant, you know, thing that's happening now in the background where they're still going back and forth i think the founder is not i think he's kind of realized now that he probably gave up too quickly and probably panicked he probably could have you know ignored it and just carried on working maybe i don't know maybe still still got buried out but he said she's still fine in court and he had an interview recently now with one radio or one tv station and he essentially um yeah he looked quite interesting i'm not sure if it's the fact that he made an interesting comment regarding how many pieces he eats i'm not sure it's because of the pieces he eats that he looks like this or is it because of the amounts of blow he's been doing prior to the interview but you guys can kind of make your own assumptions hello so papa john schnatter guys he's just not having it the founder and former ceo of his namesake restaurant did an interview with a local louisville affiliate and he accused his successor steve ritchie and current and former board members of conspiring against him schnatter was ousted after admitting to using a racial slur on a conference now, the conspiring against you statement, you, uh, but I guess, you know, he's, his face has always been like that, right? He's got quite a doughy face. You know what his face looks like? He's got the face, that, he's got like a face of an MMA fighter. You know, an MMA fighter's got loads of scar tissue. If ever you watched um, an MMA fighter interview and the camera's really up close, especially if they're not like on a, on a big station like ESPN or whatever, it's just some YouTube channel interviewing him, interviewing him or her. When they zoom in close, you can tell they've got loads of scar tissue from all the times they've been opened up, stitched up, opened up, stitched up, right, from fighting. And he looks like he's got that kind of face, just full of scar tissue or really bad plastic surgery. He doesn't look like plastic surgery. It looks like he's got just loads of scar tissue all around him. So he's just naturally got a really lumpy face anyway. Conference call last and also, it's not like a, you know, it's not conspiring against you if you decide to use the N-word in like a public setting somewhere. You know, that's not really conspiring. Maybe he means that, is that conspiring? Were they like looking for him? Was he prone to saying that word all these years and no one recorded him? Or is it the fact that they were just looking for him to make one misstep and then they are going to pounce on it? But let's check it in regardless. He says executives use that incident to, quote, steal the company from him. More importantly, Schnatter said the company's pizza just isn't the same since he's gone. Take a listen. I've had over 40 pizzas in the last 30 days, and it's not the same pizza. It's not the same product. It just doesn't. Jesus Christ. Imagine eating 40 pizzas in over in, in 30 days. So he, he what is he doing? Is he, um, I wonder if he's, was he, is he doing the thing like Barstool Sports where they kind of, get a pe go to a pizza shop and the guy eats you know a couple pizzas you know um, a couple slices sorry and then probably gives the rest of it to you know some passerby or to one of the cameramen or whoever it may be like what's he doing with that pizza is he eating the entire thing 30 pizzas in 40 days have you ever had one of those weekends where you order up a, a, a domino's like and then you've got those deals where you get two large pizzas for 20 pounds or whatever it may be have you ever done that i have right and have you ever been on an occasion where You've eaten a couple of slices and then you've just got loads left over the next day. And you're wondering, how the, why did I eat all this so much? And you just have to eat it because you don't want to throw it away. Right? You spent 20 pounds on it. So imagine having, imagine eating, and again, we don't know the size of it, but geez, that's a lot of pizza. And he's not like 500 pounds, which I'm not sure how he's like still kind of relatively fit. It doesn't really make any sense. Like he, he looks quite, you know, quite fit for his age and all that stuff like it's nutty, nutty that that is even possible. 
and he's super the sweaty pizza. as well. He looks like he's leaking. The pizza, the way they're putting the pizza together, is just not fundamentally sound to what makes a Papa John's pizza a Papa John's pizza. <laughs> I love, <laughs> I love this whole like out this kind of fallout behind Papa John's. Like, it's I feel quite sad for him, bad for him because again, like you know, you know that silhouette of his, right? The curly hair. He looks a little bit like Razor Ramon, right? Kind of style, lumpy face. You know that silhouette when, whenever you order the Papa John's pizza, you know his face. You've seen it in front of the box all the time. So I do quite feel for him. And I do recognize that, you know, every single day, every time you saw him, he was always wearing that red shirt. You know, I don't think that's actual Papa John's shirt, but he's always wearing a red shirt. Even the setting now, he's in some sort of red cinema with red backgrounds. I don't know if he actually picked it out himself, but he's, you know, he's, the, he's essentially Mr. Papa John's. And to suddenly not have that as part of your identity anymore, it must be brutal. But to go on as if this is some like, I don't know, wiki level, WikiLeaks level type of conspiracy against you is nutty, really. Especially if you just, if you were dumb enough to use the N-word in a kind of professional HR setting, especially in today's climate, and think you could get away with it. Like, the Netflix guy should have been a really good example, right? That was even more egregious because the Netflix guy was just, I think, reading out something that happened between people. Like, he was just reading out a statement and he just said the word. And he said it again, and then he just got fired. Like, it wasn't even a thing of, like, he had any history of saying anything racial, no disciplinary stuff, no cause for being misogynistic or whatever it may be, or reinforcing the patriarchy. Just the dude who was kind of conducting some kind of, you know, um, constellation or consultation, whatever it may be, and said the N-word, and he got completely ousted. So for him to say it and think he could get away with it is nutty is no longer the company's largest shareholder. He's been selling off his stock over the last year. In the interview, he talked about a quote, a day of reckoning coming in which the truth would come out <laughs> a about day what of reckoning. happened. Papa John's did not respond to a request for comment on the interview, which went viral online. You saw celebrities like Chrissy Teigen, Sarah Silverman. All did he post that? What's what they reckoning? Yeah, like quote, oh, they didn't quote that quote on there, but yeah. Big up him, man. A day of reckoning. I I think the, the actual interview asked him, oh, like, what do you mean a day of reckoning? Why can't you just talk about it now? He was like, wait, the truth, every Everything will come out in the end. The truth will be talked. It's like, dude, like this isn't that big of a deal. Do you know what I mean? Like, just just tell us what happened. And again, I'm I'm interested to see like just exactly what the what he thinks is his best defense in this regard. Like, what is the actual? Yeah, like, what's the thing that's going to vindicate him? What does he think is going to be the thing that's when people are going to be like, oh man, now I get why he said that word. I wonder what he thinks is going to be the thing. I wonder. I wonder. To, let's see anyway. Well, let's wait and see the consequences. But yeah, big up the Papa John's founder, man, or ex-founder, or well, yeah, founder. But he's not part of the company anymore, CEO. Like, you know, you're an absolute legend, my friend. Legend, legend, legend. Okay. Let's move on and get some more in. Okay, let's get some more in here. What can we do? Let's move on there. Go to my list and see what else I've got on here. Oh, tricks as well. I just wanted to quickly go back and show you why I thought this was an amazing event. Um, they actually posted some videos on the arm um, to Dixon page of the event that I went to go see Tricks Bear Mix Garage. Still got some really amazing feelings and thoughts about it all. I think I looked online and I, I think I left a comment actually on one of these people's posts. I think it must have been this post. Let's see if I can put it up on here. Uh, what are they called? Yeah, they called them Labyrinth Events. They actually left me a, I actually put a comment on there. Let me actually go to it and tell them how much I felt it was a good night. But they actually liked my comment that I made regarding their, their event and they actually put it on and kind of, you know, did bespoke lighting. I think I've got it up on here on the screen actually. So Labyrinth Events, um, tickets for Labyrinth Events, they got all listed down. This is what it actually looked like prior to us arriving at the Tricks and um, Tricks Presents with Solar and Mixed Garage. So essentially they kitted it out with lights um, on, a, yeah, lights that were kind of directly beaming onto the disco ball, which is flipping sick. And then they had these amazing LED bars behind the DJ booth that looked really, really great. So an amazing, amazing setup for the club. Really, really cool. Um, and again, something that you wouldn't necessarily do if you weren't in love with the culture, you weren't in love with dance music. And again, I'm pretty sure this edits into their overall profits. It's something that you do just for the love of it. And I really think that I'm going to start doing something similar myself going forward next 2020. I think I'm going to speak to my friend and we're going to hopefully do a thing where I know there's a lot of um, office types, especially those kind of finance boys in Liverpool Street who... I think I've kind of been blamed with the fact that they're kind of raising the prices of DJ fees because some of those guys, especially if you've got, you know, a high salary, if you put pull the resources together of like five people, you can book a big DJ to come down or to fly over to the UK, hire a venue, 
and essentially sell some tickets through RA and you could possibly make your money back and then put on a really good party for you and your friends, right? And I think I might do something similar as well in 2020 and then have the ability to then be a warm-up DJ for the play people that I'm that I'm kind of booking to come in. And in that way, you kind of put yourself, you know, next to these big DJs. People can see you, hear you, think you're good, blah, blah, blah. But just in terms of just creating an event, that's part of the thing I was looking at, thinking of all the parties I put on back in the day when I used to DJ, when I used to promote, sorry, at, at the Alibi um, and all those other places. Part of the process, or part of the reason why I like doing those kind of things was just the installation, right? Putting up posters, putting up um, wallpaper, handing out flyers, making T-shirts. That was the that was the time of that was what i loved doing man i absolutely loved it and i would love to go do it again sometime very soon um, but again so yeah this labyrinth um again super inspiring they post an actual video of the actual event here they've got on their page i think this might be one of first towards the end you can definitely tell it's an individual guy, isn't it? Look at the lights. Oh, wow. So good. So good, man. That lighting setup is incredibly, incredibly amazing, man. And then we've got probably another video here, too. Oh, this is God Jansen at. Oh, is it E1? Where was this? December. Okay, man. Amazing. Okay, I'm definitely going to go to that one. The reminiscing of 7 a.m. with Gerd Janssen at E1. We're back with him on December the 13th for the Perpetual with Arm, Gerd Janssen, DJ Tennis and more. Oh, it's in Bristol. Sh damn it. On the 13th. Okay. Wish I could have gone to that one. So I think the next day we're probably going to go to the innovation. Oh, I'm going to go back home and just start making it go. This is what it's going to be. Yeah, so the 14th day after, so you probably can't get to this. You know, that was a cool event. Then the next, so let's go back to the arm thing. So this is basically a video of um, uh, tricks playing at the event at Mix. I really want to use a rotary mixer. There's a lot of really good reviews from the DJs about you know the warmth that you get from turning the knobs around. The feel that you get. You know, I love you know what I love as well. The fact that Vix now plays like Vixen given the way he kind of skanks is basically the same thing. It's so cool. It reminds me of what's his name? Uh the kid that kind of loves the information here. Zarish? Zivarish? What's his name? Zivarish must be Zarish, right? He's got the same mannerism. There's one video, another one as well. So amazing. Really well done. And again, just something you don't need to do. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the beginning stages of like, or the early last week of party days to go back to the day when we were in this London. Like they put a real, real, real effort into their production of the show. It's just incredible. It made the difference. It really made a difference. Look at that. Look at the lighting. So the place like Mix, they really smashed it, man. That's so good. So, so good. Another one is always on video. Like, so, honestly, one of the best nights I've had in a while. That harmony of, like, the perfect crowd, great production, really great DJs. Um, amazing security, great bar staff, like just harmonious relationship that kind of allowed everyone to have a good time. Even the bar backs were cool. Just stellar, stellar, stellar night. Man. I love dance music so much, man. I love it. I love it. I love the nightlife. I can't wait to be in my room. 2020 is good. 2020 is good. I'm putting in more shows. Yeah. Intimate shows for a year. Just really kind of go for it. Yeah, for a year would be a good way to do it. Kill a four parties a year, just smash it around the park. It's so awesome. Ah, you can't stop. You can't stop this. You can't stop this. So good, man. So good. Look at that. Amazing to see. I had a video on mine too that I think I've kind of deleted. I think I've got to say. Yeah, so amazing, man. 
I really recommend you go check out Tricks if you have to go see him play or go to a little training event on the weekend. Again, I think I'm going to do this more often, man, going anyway forward. I've already said it before. I'm going to make sure I just, you know, invest all my money, especially on the weekends, to buy more tunes, buy more DJ equipment, upload all the stuff that I'm doing now, and obviously making sure that I'm going to actual DJ events. I think we have reached a point in our especially in london nightlife um scene where for the most part a lot of people are kind of um opting to go out on a weekday and go to like a pub or bar and hang out there you know places like the lion and lamb and just see some you know someone like craig richards play in the corner somewhere you know that'd be amazing but i think sometimes as well you can get a little bit you know it's good to sometimes remind yourself just how amazing dance music culture is and just how amazing it is to be in a room full of people that share the same amount of passion for the dance music you have under some amazing dark dimly lit dance floor meeting new people have sharing a drink having some fun and i think the best way to do it is to go to an actual event curated by promoters who actually give an f about the music and they put their time their effort and blood sweat and tears into it because i can't even imagine how long it took to set this all up beforehand make sure everything's going well and obviously to invite everybody in and have this amazing light show happening in the heart of east london you know 20 minutes from where i live like it's an absolute like you know i'm I'm chuffed, man. I can't say anything more positive about the things that those guys did. And again, I can't wait to go see more of them. And I think in general, we might see this happening more often with Intervision um, DJs. I think I mentioned it to my friend the other day. I think, I, I guess that the fact that they've got such a control on how they're presented online um, is going to be good going forward. We're going to see maybe more images, more videos of um, DJs from Intervision Label uh, DJing under because if, even if you scroll down this feed on Armstrong Dixon, all the lighting and LED things look quite similar. So it seems like they're going to make an effort to make sure if a promoter is booking one of their DJs, they have to do this. They have to get this lighting company to do this fitting in there because that's what they want it to be quite harmonious and have kind of a through line, which is quite difficult to do. Think about DJs on labels, even a label like Hessel Audio. It might sound similar, but pr probably production wise, there's no diff. You probably couldn't tell who was playing uh, if it was a Hessel Audio label night, right? But imagine if Hustle Audio had a way to kind of um, kit out the club or the venue in a certain way that when you walked in, you automatically knew it was a Hustle Audio club night. And I'm pretty sure that's what um, individuals are going through. So when you walk into a club, no matter where it is, if it's Corsica, if it's Fold, if it's Mixed Garage, you will feel like you're in an individual party, which is amazing to see, man. Really, really inspiring for any promoter out there. And something that I'm definitely going to try and do going forward, especially in the new year. So yeah, definitely check out Amto Dixon, one of my favorite um, Instagram pages out there. Everything concerning um, Intervision, everything concerning Armin Dixon, the two main head hunters of the label. But, you know, other artists are on there too. Make sure you check them out like Tricks, one of my favorite um, up-and-coming DJs now at the moment. Anyway, that's an hour. Thanks so much for tuning in for the Action Zinger Show. It's been episode number 260. As always, if you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review so people can find the show. That'll go a long way. Also, if you're watching via the YouTube, uh, leave me a thumbs up, smash that like button, subscribe to the show, come back later, check out my clips my clips playlist of all the videos I post up on there and get yourself acquainted on that regard. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment below or get in touch, reach out to me via the contact button or at my website, which is agasinozinga.com, agasinozinga.com and all my socials are below too. But I'll see you again very, very soon for an episode of the show. Until then, take care, be safe and make sure you look left and right when you cross the road. Bye. <laughs>